Okay. Is that okay for you, Faye? Yep. That's very good. <clears throat> so, um, well, we can't tell us. I'm happy to chat with you about anything you'd like to talk about. I understand uh, the general topic is um, in relation to uh, peer review and publishing from a uh, medical student's perspective. Is that correct? Yes. Um, we actually ran a session on Tuesday on copyright and lots of them were really interested in the peer review experience because they're keen to publish and a number of them are just terrified <laughs> of peer review because they're not aware of who does it and how it's done and how to find out about peer review more. So they're very keen to hear from you. Hmm. Um what experience of the students had of um, publication? Uh, I suppose some of them may have written a, a, a paper from time to time, aren't they, or was? Um, all of them aspire to write a paper, and yeah. most of the students that we talked to um, as background for this, and particularly at the Tuesday session, hadn't yet written a paper, though some had been co authors. Yeah. So, at what stage of their medical training are they? So, mostly they're third year and fourth year students. Right. So, they will have done a bit of a research project or something? Or yes. Or? Yep. Um, well, uh, I mean, if, if, uh, if, if, it, if anybody's got any research that they confident about, it's a very good idea to see whether they can, <coughs> whether you can get it published because that's the current mechanism whereby new knowledge is disseminated and uh, the current mechanism whereby contributions to knowledge are recognised. So it's, uh, it's a very important part of the whole research enterprise. Um, <clears throat> so, are we recording this session for them, or what's uh, happening? We are. Good. Yep. Okay. Well, um, to those of you who are watching or listening, um, I'd encourage you to think very carefully about uh, the, the research that you've done and uh, consider the possibility of publishing it because uh, it's no, no point, as uh, a friend of mine used to say, there's no research without publication. And what it meant by that, I think, was that if you do the research and you make a series of findings and you draw conclusions, but you don't make it generally unknown, um, well, it's not generally known. And in consequence, um, knowledge is not advanced. So we're very fortunate that um, we have lots of channels whereby information can be put about, but um, there's a formality about reporting on research and science that favours the use of um, the journals of science, of medicine, uh, as the medium whereby that new knowledge is communicated. So um, thinking about publication is a very important thing to do. and. Perhaps the next step after deciding that it's something that you want to get involved in is to make a decision about where you think that your research should be published. Um, is it a very specialised variety of research into a new microsome or a chunk of DNA or something or other that um, really is a uh, fundamental interest that may not be of interest to many people, but you probably find that there's a journal with a special title that more or less matches the general field of your research. It might be a journal of uh, molecular science or molecular biology or molecular genetics um, that, uh, that, that would appeal to you as a means of um, or as a place where you might send your findings to, to have them published. So, um, the first point that I would like to make with you is 
be serious about thinking of publication. Um, it's a very good way to disseminate new knowledge. It's not the only way, but it's a very good way. It's a traditional way, and um, at the moment at least, uh, it's the preferred way, uh, first up, of, of communicating a new breakthrough or a new insight. So um, that's a, an important reason for thinking about it. And second, making a choice of where it is that you want to send it, because the journals, as you probably already appreciate, are very different in format and style and they're different in their requirements of you as a scientist or an author uh, and you need to be sure that the journal that you want to send it to that you understand what its requirements are and virtually all journals that I know of of relevance to you as uh, young biomedical research people public health research people virtually all of those journals will have a website and go in there and have a look and it will give you a, a link through to a set of instructions for authors as to how your paper needs to be formatted and prepared and submitted so that it can be judged as to whether it's worthy for publication or whether it may be worthy for publication but not in that journal in which case the editors might suggest to you that you send it to another journal. Um, and you can then follow those uh, those instructions and prepare your paper and submit it. So, um, yeah, is there any questions on what I've said that uh, you'd like me to cover in a bit more depth? So one of the um, students that we spoke to earlier um, asked the question about whether it was worthwhile thinking about some uh, a new large journal like PLOS One to try out um, a as a new young author to, to try out their article with rather than seek, seeking a very well established journal. PLOS One, PLOA, is so all in capitals. Um, something about um, the People's Library of Science or something like that stands for. Yep. is um, a, a, a quite a different format for um, publication to standard journals and um, it's, it's quick, it gets papers out there fast, it does not copy edit the paper, so you better be sure you've got your grammar right before you send it in, and it's online, there's no paper for publication. Um, but it has... Um, what's called the impact factor, which is the average number of times that any paper published in that journal will be quoted by another individual, impact factor, uh, is high, by which I mean somewhere around 10, 15. So that is a good a marker of a journal of good quality. And uh, uh, very prestigious journals like New England Journal of Medicine uh, what their impact factor is, you can look it up on Google, but it's something like 25 or 35. Lancet, another one, very high impact factor. And um, so lots of journals have impact factors around two. Mm. Um, and uh, the impact factor is an indication of the quality of the papers that are submitted and the interest that the readership has in them. Clearly, if yours is a paper that uh, attracts a lot of attention, then its individual um, citation index, as it's called, which is the number of times that particular paper is cited, might be uh, you know, 10 or 12 might be 300 if it's a real breakthrough or 3,000 if you've discovered a cure for cancer. Mm. Or 3 million maybe, I don't know. Uh, but PLOS One is is a good, good journal and uh, the turnaround between the time of submitting the paper and having it approved or rejected quite quick. Um, and you'll know whether they want it or not. Um, 
in short time, so it's necessary to consider the longer and upper term. So if you think you can think plus one, you need to have a look at the stuff that's published there to see whether it's like what you're wanting to get published. Um, if it is, then by all means go for it. So the other concern that students um, had and were particularly keen to get information on was in terms of submitting to um, a journal, a good medical journal, um, when should they ex expect what expect some feedback, expect to be able to be published, to be able to think about what they can achieve while they're a PhD student? They are all <coughs> very appropriate questions to ask. Um, it is the case that the vast majority of high quality medical journals and journals that have to do with biological science and so forth related to, to medicine use what we call a peer review process, which is a mechanism whereby um, the editors of the journal, who are the people who see your paper first, look at it and say, well, <coughs> we think it's worth pursuing. <coughs> so we'll ask two or three people, uh, experts in the field, the immediate field in which you've written, um, to have a look at it and make a judgment about whether methods that you've used to sound, whether the questions that you've asked are appropriate, whether if it's the kind of paper that you test hypotheses in, it's not paper that's uh, describing something, and both that and interventions have their place, of course. Um, so they'll make a judgment about whether to send it up to review, and if they do, then they'll choose some reviewers and, as I've said, send it to them. Um, you can imagine that if you're a busy scientist and uh, you get a request from a journal to review a paper, you make a judgment about whether this is just going to be a drag, in which case you politely refuse to review, um, or if you've got so much going on that uh, it's just impossible or whether it really interests you and you're prepared to spend the time going over it in detail. Um, sometimes it's very difficult as an editor to find anybody to do the review because everybody's busy writing <coughs> pardon me, research grants or writing their own papers or teaching students or conducting their own research or whatever. And so it's not uncommon for an editor to have to approach fix reviewers at the time too who do the job. They do not get paid <clears throat> and so you have no purchase over them as an editor. If they you might say to them, I'd like the review in three weeks. Well, you might like the review in three weeks, but you might not get the review weeks. So then in four weeks or five weeks the editor has to make a choice. Does he or she go looking for another peer reviewer or does he send a friendly reminder to the person who said they'd do it or does he call them up and say we've got a problem or whatever it is. So it's a big piece mm. of the editorial process. Once the editor gets, if they're lucky, two reviews They'll read them after having read the paper and think, hmm, okay, the reviewers think that this is quite a good paper, but it's got a few touches that need to be smoothed out. So the editor will send back to the author of the paper, or authors, the reviews and say, we're prepared to have another look at this paper if you take note of what the reviewers have said and we want you to submit a revision. So, then the authors 
Um, some of them are very prompt, others of them uh, <coughs> are busy, busy themselves, doing more research, writing grant applications, taking the kids to and from kindergarten, sick, travelling, doing clinical work, washing the car, whatever. So sometimes it takes several weeks, if not longer, to get the authors to sit down and revise the paper. It's not a nice thing to have to do. So you've got to go over it all again, you know. You've sort of produced this paper. It's a bit like coming to the end of a pregnancy and you think, whack over the kids finally are. And then someone comes along and says, well, not as perfect as you thought. You better pop it back in for another month. <laughs> well, you know, you get my drift. It's no, it's, uh, that's, uh, as far as I know, not possible. But um, <laughs> working on a review of a paper can be agonising. Hmm. My personal philosophy about it is if you get the review in the morning, free up your afternoon and do as much as possible to get the changes made to the paper that day. Why? Because you'll probably be angry with the reviewer and you'll have the head of creative energy. But don't waste time writing rude comments about how ignorant and stupid the reviewer is. Just get on and fix it. If they want you to start if I object to you starting a sentence with and or but, just take it out. Or if they want more details about you know, the mice that you used, put it in. So there's a bit of gamesmanship here, but if you delay over that, you work yourself up into a ladder, you get into a psychological space where you're not really keen on making the changes that are in your said, mm. very important to do it quickly and to do it without getting embroiled in a verbal battle. Sometimes the reviewers are pretty, pretty dumb. Um, they'll say, the sample size is not, not clear to me. Well, they missed paragraph seven, in which it said the sample size was 47, right? Yeah. So in answering that, you reply saying, I'm sorry, they found it wasn't clear. The answer is the sample was 47. Further details can be found in paragraph two. So you just you know, treat them with kid gloves <clears throat> and avoid expletives. <laughs> or nasty statements. Just think of them as relatives who turned up at Christmas. <laughs> Be nice to them, otherwise you'll have pump body all over your face. <laughs> uh, and if sometimes there are genuine misunderstandings, then you've got to tackle that and do it in a collegial manner. Mm. And peer reviewing is improved quite a lot lately because. Um, it used to be totally anonymous, which just meant anybody could you know, have a go at someone else if they felt like it. And lots of journals now require reviews to be signed, mm -hmm. so that you, the, the person writing them has to be careful. And if you think this is something you need to journals, sorry, not. The same process applies to grant applications. So when you're mm -hmm. coming to do your PhD project or whatever it is that you, you want, you know, suddenly discover you need money, then you're going to have to write a grant application. Then you write it the same way you write a paper. Mm -hmm. Put it in and it'll come back to you with referees' comments and some of them will be good and some of them will be crap. But, um, I've had lots of experience with this, um, both myself and with students and colleagues. And once again, it's very wise to be exhaustive in the way that you treat the comments. You go through each one, write a letter and say, this is what I've done, then track change the document, the paper, and show that you've done it. It's 
send it back um, with a bit of luck. Um, the editors will say this is fine, or they might say, well, you know, the, what the referees required is so substantial, we'll send the paper and the letter and the amendments back to them and get them to make a choice whether to publish or not. Mm. That can take months. <coughs> and um, it leads me to say the process of publication, um, even in the best journals and the best circumstances, you can't rush it. It's going to take you months. It's part of a year, probably, to get a paper published. And a lot of obvious things, like don't copy material out of someone else's paper and put it in there, because smart editors have got pages and packages and found a taken someone else's idea, that's it, baby, curtains. Mm. Um, and, yeah, well, lots of rules about writing papers that you can read about on the web, like, you know, always get a friend to read it, mm. check it out. If you've got access to a person who can write proper English, send it to them, get, you know, send them a bottle of wine and their manuscript and say, fix the grammar. Uh, it can be very, very, very helpful, especially if it clarifies what it is you're trying to say. So, um, you now that's a bit of the background to it, and uh, peer review is... Um, some people don't believe in it. Richard Smith, who used to be editor of the BMJ, believes that... Um, you know, he sort of took a radical view about peer review and said it's just a waste of space. Because the quality of the reviews is often not strong, mm. um, and it preserves a kind of conservatism inside science that inhibits innovation. Well, I mean, he's he's uh, taken a fairly radical view on that. His latest pronouncements are that all medical journals should perish. Mm. Not just the peer reviewers, but the journals themselves, because they take so long, they dither around, and they're somewhat idiosyncratic and depend on the taste of the editors. With the web and social media and the rest of it, why not use that? Well, maybe it's right, maybe that's what's coming. But for the moment, I will say to my students, just uh, have a glass of water and get over it, because this is the way we do it at the moment. Mm. And you can man the barricades and start a revolution when you've got 20 or 30 papers. Not at the moment, not the beginning of your career, it's not on. And indeed, if you go to write a PhD thesis these days, most universities will say, well, because PhD theses were rather like a grave where people would bury their findings and no one apart from their spouse or significant other would ever read it. This is ridiculous. So why don't we say, instead of writing a thesis that no one reads, why don't we say, you can do your PhD on the basis of four to six quality publications. And by the time you finish your PhD, you will be uh, published as a scientist, which is terrific. People will know who you are. Mm. Your work will be on the scientific record. So this is what me. This is why you know, publication matters. For the moment, this is it. Doesn't matter whether the journal's online only or whatever. Um, uh, but choose a journal with some reputation, that would be mine. So certainly it's the f f journal f that you submitted to first. I include PLOS mm. in that. If you're working in a clinical area, then you might be thinking about a more general medical journal, such as the Medical Journal of Australia or a British Medical Journal or something like that. But again, it's very important to get the stuff out. 
We have had a number of students um, who are doing um, uh, their thesis by publication and so I think that's very helpful advice about the length of time that it takes and being prepared and being committed to respond very quickly um, will help them ensure that the publications are out in a suitable time. Um, one of the other questions the students had was about whether it's good practice or it would be good to encourage them to share, to practice review their colleagues, um, PhD students' articles so that they can learn more about what articles look like rather than just looking at published ones and actively provide each other with advice. Would you recommend that? Uh, absolutely. That sounds fantastic, actually, because you'd learn, well, you'd learn about another field of interest, which is always positive. Uh, because you, you know, can't imagine that two students would be doing the same topic, so that would be informative. Um, and the likelihood is that they'll pick up something that you, know, you overlook. Um, it's curious, isn't it? I, my experience, and I do a lot of writing, um, but the value of a, of a good editor is huge, actually. Mm. You can't edit your own stuff, or well, you can to a degree, but so when I write stuff, I generally, nearly always try to, even um, medical press stuff, I was Australian doctor, uh, you know, Superman comics and that sort of thing, even when you write for them, um, I try to get someone to have a look at it, because nine times out of ten they'll say, where was your head at when you constructed this bizarre sentence? But I can't understand it. And it's very helpful. And you think, oh, right. Um, yeah, I should fix that. So, but you miss it. And they write something they think is pretty fantastic, and I look at it, and I pick up stuff. Mm. And I say, hmm, well, okay, I suppose that's right. So it's a very good... Very good process, um, and I think the more you can share that with your fellow students, that's, that's brilliant. Mm. It also enable you to be a better reviewer, mm. better editor, and that'll spill over into when you're writing, because inevitably you'll think, oh, well, I don't want to make that mistake. You know? This person, this person, the introduction they've written to this paper is just, oh, God, it's so waffly. They cut the crap. You know, the first 14 sentences, 15 sentences, I bet they enjoyed writing them, but they're horrible to read. <laughs> oh, the global burden of mental illness is stupendous. And they think, oh, is it right? Okay, I would never have guessed. And they go on and on and on. And you know, and you think, well, okay. So you know, I belong to a poetry writing group, and I tell you, that is amazing. Ah. You, you know, write a poem, take a long degree, and the guy running it said, hmm, this is a really interesting thing. Why didn't you start with verse three? And you go down you look at verse three, okay. Uh, so what should I do with verses one and two? <clears throat> well. I suggest you keep them for another poem. <laughs> and it'd be the point because you think, wow, yeah, that's right. Now, that was really where I got to it, you know? Mm. And then going through and removing all the redundant adjectives. Mm. Nobody wants to, no, nobody wants to read those. So it, it's a very good discipline, but you're going to achieve the same thing with astute editing of prose, I think. Good for the reader, good good for the student who's doing it. They probably get the maximum benefit and I would hope good for the person who, um, whose work's being done. It also teaches you uh, negotiating skills because yeah. you can never tell, people are very sensitive about their writing. Often. Everyone thinks they write brilliantly on the side. I mean, I haven't written it met anyone who said, oh, I'm a shit writer, you know, I'm really hopeless, you know, if you have a look at this sort of a sort of the coming and finish, sort of glowing, the sheet of paper's glowing, 
because that pool had so much pride over it. Would you mind having a look at this? You have a look at it and go, ugh. <laughs> so then you've got to negotiate how how you manage that critique. Yep. That's part of the part of the deal. So you've got to learn how to take criticism and learn how to equally difficult for lots of people how to give it. Yep. So I'd be a strong advocate of that idea of shared commentary or criticism, editorial criticism. Yep. And I've got to say, with the feedback that I've got on the journal articles I've written, every single article has been a better one at the end because of the feedback. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I think that's true. I mean, I think that is true. And just on the thesis thing, I've marked quite a few PhD theses that have been by publication. And the timing is, uh, is important because if you can get a collection of six papers, all of which have been published, that's better than a collection of four papers that have been published and two sections which are papers submitted for publication. Because ah. the marker of the thesis, I think, are, are mm. four that have been published I can relax about because they've already been through the sophisticated review process and, as you say, the richer for having been critiqued. But how do I know that the ones that have been submitted for publication aren't going to get the kibosh put on them? I don't. So I've got to go over them myself mm. in detail and, you know, I might find all sorts of nasty things. So if you want to keep your brilliance sanitised from the interference of a bolsy PhD reviewer, make sure the papers in there are published. Mm. Uh, they then might complain about the lack of a linking commentary or some other thing. It's easily fixed. But that's easy compared with having your thesis knocked back because you failed to realise that you're introducing bias in the way in which you analyse the data, try the data, data, so you've got to back, go back and maybe reanalyse the data. Oh, man, you know, not nice. Mm. Not nice. Good point. They need to get cracking. Yeah. Let's uh, start the PhD with a view to having uh, what stipulation is at the university there, but general at least four published papers, and sometimes some universities require six. That's hard work. Mm. And it's a good three years' work. So you just, you know, as I say to people, they say, oh, I, I want to do a PhD with you. I say, that's good. What would you, what would you like to achieve with it? I'd like to save the world. <laughs> I say, wow, that's a great idea. That's fantastic. And what's the topic? Saving the world. Mm -hmm. Right. So how long do you think, how long have you got for this? Oh, 100 years? I said, that's about right. And then the conversation changes. So what did they say to me? Well, what do you think? I say to them, no topic is too small for a PhD. No topic is too small. Mm. And they look at me. And I say, I'll say it again. Why, they say, I said, because once you start looking at the topic and doing work in it, you'll find that it will expand like a balloon. Mm. And by the time you get to near the end of your PhD, you'll think, how am I going to get all this stuff assembled? Because mm. there's so much. If you start off wanting to save the world, then by about the end of the first year, there'll be a big bang as the balloon explodes. Mm. And that's why 50%, one reason, 50% of PhDs are never finished. Mm. It's a salutary lesson. And the other thing I say to them is once you've chosen your topic, make sure you love it. Mm. Love it? Love it. 
it's going to be like a family member. You're going to have to love this topic in sickness and in health. It's going to drive you nuts. You're going to curse it. And if you don't start out loving it, it'll eat you. Mm. So there's some grand paternal advice <laughs> for aspiring PhD students. That's very helpful. No topic is too small. If you say, oh, I want to study 17th chromosome and the other in some rare disease, which are only three cases a year in Australia. Sounds good to me. Nice and small. Mm. Start with, until you start looking into the 17th chromosome, and then you'll discover a lot of knowledge out there that you've got to get on top of, and the thing is not as simple as it first look. Mm. But if you want to start out with a topic, it's my topic is the genetics of Alzheimer's disease. Mm. Well, goodbye and good luck. <laughs> That's terrific. I'm 37 not... varieties of Alzheimer's disease and a very big genome. Mm. It's like someone saying, I want to explore space. And I've got this you know, hyperdrive that enables me to get around the universe. Well, you know, what are you going to do? Can't do it that way. Mm. So nearly all science is incremental. Little, 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 little. Mm -hmm. And steady. So are there any other particularly burning questions, Imogen, from our students? <laughs> yeah, I've got a couple of questions. Okay. Do you want to come and sit Lovely. in the seat? We'll, we'll just swap. <laughs> Hi, Professor Leader, it's Imogen here. How are you? Good, great to meet you. Uh, I have some questions um, that have been sent through to me by the ANU Students Medical Society. Uh, I'm not entirely sure at what point in their studies these students are up to, um, but they're going through the process for a research project. Um, they have to write a paper for publication. And so a number of the students are seeking some of your advice. You've Oh, oh. Well, that's what he. Yeah. Back again. Back again. Great. Excellent. <laughs> uh, they're seeking some advice to do with writing an article. You've touched on a couple of the points um, about incorporating review of feedback into uh, a revised paper. And you've also touched on um, writing a, a letter to the editor of a journal. Um, explaining the changes that have been made in a document and you've said to, you know, um, be exhaustive and track changes and all that sort of thing. Have you got any further comments about that? And then I've got one question that they've also asked that may not have been touched on as, you, as you've um, gone through that process of explaining um, what authors should do in that situation. Um. I don't have anything to add really to what I've said, so yep. perhaps you might go to the question. question. Sure. So really they're after some tips for how to deal with conflicting opinions from reviewers if the editor hasn't provided any direction on how to address perhaps different issues raised by different reviewers. Mm. Um, well, I think you know, if there are contradictions in what the reviewers say, you just have to politely point that out. Yeah, yeah. If what want you to expand the description of the study sample, let's suppose, and the other says it's too wordy as it is, mm. um, you just write back and say, regrettably, we're unable to reconcile the comments of reviewers one and two with regard to this, but would be happy to make. <coughs> Any, amend any amendments based on their consensus view or something of that effect, just politely say that uh, someone's telling you to go right and um, you, you want to, and the other one says go left, well, you know, do yourself a damage if you can't do both at once. Mm. So, um, you know, I just think you have to deal with it diplomatically and step around it. Mm. Okay. And then I guess I've got a couple of um, questions about, um, you spoke about uh, 
the value for authors of just get out there, put some publication, put pub, get work published. Do you see peer review as playing a valuable role in seeing what the next generation of researchers are doing and also in their thinking in their area of research? And a valuable contribution to the reviewers. Uh, do you see that as a good way uh, for established academics such as yourself to get a sense of what the next generation of researchers are? Oh, I see. Yeah. yeah. Um, Yes, that's probably true. Um, there are multiple ways in which you can get this, of course, by means other than peer review, by attending conferences, by reading journals yeah. that have got published articles in them. I mean, that's probably the best and most common way, um, given that um, the ultimate fate of high-quality journals from uh, younger people is... Hey, hey, high quality articles from younger people is that they'll end up being published. So if you read the journals, you get a pretty fair idea. Mm. Um, there is there is an aspect of that that's somewhat unsavoury, and that is that it's not unknown, it's not common, but not unknown for um, a breakthrough article to have been sent to a reviewer who's working in the same field and who reads them and thinks, oh, why didn't I think of that? So they then promptly uh, write a paper saying more or less the same thing and pull a scorn on yours. Um, so that yours doesn't see the light of day and theirs does, especially if they're a famous person. Mm -hmm. So don't, you, know, you need to remember that science is not a game of the gods, it's a game of competitive humans. Um, and they misbehave. And uh, there, there have been many examples of misconduct on the part of reviewers. Uh, I mean, uh, it's tough. So they might well learn what's going on in the mind of the next generation and appropriate it for themselves. Yeah. yeah. Um, that, that's, not, that's not a common thing, but I just mention it to you as a reality, right? It's part of the reality. It might be, I don't know, less than 1% of all peer review that's nasty like that, but it, it does happen. Mm. Ideas get stolen. Mm. And, you know, the history of science is you know, Crick and Watson, where did they get their idea about the double helix? And, some X-ray crystallography conducted by a woman down the road who couldn't interpret what she'd found. So they said, oh, that's very interesting. And they went out and said, oh, 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 it's a double helix. So then they published it. Yeah, wow. They got the Nobel Prize. Mm. Of course, they deny that. I it mean, it's not quite as simple as that, but you understand what I mean. Yep, the principle. Science is very competitive and it's not guided by... There's, there's no prize for coming second. Mm. You discover a new drug for the treatment of rheumatoid, art, rheumatoid arthritis, you're it. Someone else comes along a week later and discovers the same drug and never hear of it. Mm. Mm. So that's the nature of medical research, very competitive. So of course there'll be misconduct, that's why there are rules around <clears throat> plagiarism, and that's why now uh, anonymous peer review has decreased in frequency and it's nearly all nominated. Uh, so you can see who's reading it. And, uh, and people who write papers are given a choice quite frequently now. Um, not so much a choice, an opportunity to nominate people that they don't want to review their paper. Yeah. Yeah. Or oh, they might nominate people who they do want to review their paper, but then there have been some examples recently where nominated reviewers turned out to be, you know, uncles, aunts, and uh, general hangers-on and others whose opinions um, favour the publication of the paper in a way that. Um, Totally unconscionable. So, you know, there again, there's, there's, uh, there are websites now that just delight in publishing news about 
papers that have been retracted because the peer review's been faulty or the authors have been devious in the way they presented their data or faked it or something. It seems to be something every day comes through on my um, computer. More details about stuff that shouldn't have happened but does. And I'm sure it always has gone on. It's just that we now know about it a lot. Mm. Well, I think that probably has exhausted our questions. So... So, my last comment, you've got to write a paper, you've got to write a paper. Um, uh, try to remember that um, the point of it is that someone will read it. Mm. You're not writing a paper so that it will um, be the most splendid archive that you can have framed and put on the wall and say that's going to be tremendous satisfaction as an author writing that. It's pity no one ever read it, but you know, I really enjoyed writing it. You're not writing for yourself. Yep. They will establish in, in your mind who the reader is, and we only think of one perhaps, mm. and writing to that person so that what you say and the style of which you say it is, is uh, very good. There was a, an editor of the British Medical Journal who was there for about 15 years. The journal really thrived under his editorship. And when he was asked what his goal was to what the secret of his success was, he said, well, I try to keep it entertaining. Because if people don't find it entertaining, they don't read it. If they're not read it, it doesn't matter what's in there. Mm. And The Economist, which is the most splendid newspaper, produces, and you can't do this with scientific papers quite frequently, but the principles are very similar. <coughs> it doesn't publish long articles, it publishes articles that you can read uh, you know, in the space of five or ten minutes. And it's designed for a readership of busy people who don't have to go chasing websites or anything to get more information. It's all there. And it has a bracing style, which I commend to people thinking of writing, because like, you can't emulate it. As I say, the style of scientific writing is generally different, but it's a real education in how to communicate through writing. So always conscious mm. of the readership. Mm. Yeah. That reminds me of a comment from the editor of Nature who was in Australia the year before last and interviewed on the Science Show. And he said he was proudest of the articles that were interesting and he wanted to publish interesting articles, not ones that were turgid or, or didn't have an interesting research question. Do you want to make a comment on the importance of testing the research I question? I that totally. Yep. I that totally. Okay. And um, uh, no, when I was editor of the MJA, I used to send back papers that um, were otherwise sound, but all but ended up saying, "Oh, it's a big problem. More research is needed." Mm. Papers, uh, excuse me, you're paid by the taxpayer. You've done some important research. What would you think it appropriate for us to do? Mm. Just have a guess. You've thought about this problem for three years. Where do the possible solutions lie? I'm not asking you to say this will solve it, I'm asking you to say these are possibilities. This particularly the case of Indigenous help. Oh, the guts are enormous. Oh, it seems that our monetary supplements are not working. Oh, the distances are so vast. More research is needed. Really? Have you got any suggestions about anything that could be done? On the basis of what you've been doing, you've been looking into the supply of fresh food. Should we be looking at a 
logistics network whereby refrigerated food can be supplied to remote and up Aboriginal communities. Ridiculous idea, is it? Well, not quite, but you know, well, think of something that isn't ridiculous. Mm. Just give us the benefit of your thoughts. That begins to make it interesting. Especially the people who are not necessarily researchers. This is where knowing your audience is. Where if you're writing a paper for general practitioners, then it's got to be interesting. It's got to be interesting to them as people who are dealing with 50 people a day and they haven't got long, and so what are they going to do? Mm. Don't tell them to do more research. So, there we go. Yep. Make it interesting. Conceivably, you could make it entertaining, but don't, don't be too brash. But for goodness sake, keep it concise, focused, clear, and get your mates to edit it if you're not, I mean, in any case, but if you're not strong with those attributes, bring others in. Yep. Look, that's terrific advice. It's been a really, really helpful hour with you, Stephen. And um, on behalf of all the students who have seen and will see this, I'd like to thank you so much for your time. Um, We'll let you know when it's available. We'll be breaking it up into little chunks and right. it's just terrific. I'm just so grateful you were able to make this time. Thank you. Well, it's good to talk and um, I wish the students every success with their studies and their research. It's a fantastic field and it's the hallmark of what distinguishes successful medicine from failed medicine. This. Mm extent to which we take a scientific approach to the problems at the moment and the problems of the future. So, good fortune. Lovely. Thank you very much. Bye. See you now. Take care. See you. Nice to Lovely. Yeah. Okay. That was great. That was He's well such well an well interesting <laughs> bloke. Yeah. Laugh out loud yeah. <laughs> you can relax. <laughs> Where's my thing? Oh, yes, that's why I can't put it back. Wasn't that right? Well, we were really lucky. That was fantastic. Just fantastic. That was lovely. That was just great. And he's such an engaging person. And he's just extraordinarily eminent. Yeah. And he said yes. <laughs> we said, Can you give us wow. something that we can... Wonderfully engaged. Just for, for an hour, it didn't feel like no. no, it didn't feel no, anything like that. just by yeah. like yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah. It's amazing. And that'll break up nicely in comp yeah. components about yeah. um, publishing mm. your... Doing your thesis by publications, doing your PhD. That was lovely advice about doing your PhD. <coughs> that was really, really good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and then those tips about uh, you know revising papers and things like yeah. that. That was spot on. That's so, great. Uh, so I'm glad you could come over. Yeah. Even though we didn't get students, it doesn't matter. I think it didn't record. They'll, they'll be watching this online. And uh, yeah, oh, it's great. It's wonderful. Just wonderful. Yeah. And yeah. welcome, Tom. Yeah. <laughs> take nice strawberries. To meet you. Oh, yeah. Take, take strawberries, please. Don't oh, take strawberries. Thank you. That was great. I, I really yeah. think that'll chunk nicely. Yeah, that'll be awesome. So he's really good. Great. And it didn't matter that we didn't get the students who we were here. And fortunately, yeah. from copyright, they actually asked a lot of questions okay. that were relevant. I know. See you. Bye. I know. That's awesome, isn't it? That you oh, could actually God, bring those so to the... Oh, yeah. He was yeah. just wonderful. Yeah. And he's really committed to this sort of thing. So, mm. man, that was wonderful. I'll have That's to send great. him a thank you bottle of wine. Mm, that's one. Yeah, yeah, and I loved yeah. him saying basically, you know, just man it up and have a glass of water and move on. Because mm. it is, you get it. You, think, oh, you can't be just, precious. Or, yeah. No. Just it, says she who faced it. But anyway. Very. Oh, God, that was good. But it did. Uh, I was going to say, reviewing your list of additional material today did make me think I think we might need to add a segment yep. on how do you find a book publisher and how do you find a journal publisher That's... and take it through step by step. Okay. And I was just thinking today that was a little gap. Right. Okay. And one of the things we could do um, is... <clears throat> no, no, I'm fine. I don't mind who does that. 